What you are looking at are some of the first complex organisms to colonize dry land around 750 million years ago. These are lichens, which are fungi that have captured photosynthetic algae or cyanobacteria into their hyphal tissues. So they're not a single organism, but a composite of two or sometimes three different genomes. Lichens are well known for being early pioneers onto newly exposed rocks and facilitate the establishment of plants and animals that arrive later. But on our ancient planet, were lichens really first onto land? Probably not, according to recent molecular evidence. The fungi, however, are good candidates for establishing themselves onto land prior to vascular plants or animals. And that's what this video is about, the fungi, or fungi, which is another common way to pronounce this large biological kingdom. There is now fossil evidence that the first fungal spores with hyphae accumulated in ancient estuaries a billion years ago in what is now the Canadian Arctic. The first land plants don't show up in the fossil record for another 500 million years. And when they do, these early plants are associated with a group known as the endomycorrhizal fungi. Endomycorrhizal fungi live symbiotically with most plants now, usually in mutually beneficial ways. But if we go way back 480 million years ago to the Ordovician period when things like mosses were first establishing themselves onto land, we often find that they are associated with endomycorrhizal fungi. And we don't really know what those relationships were like, but ecological experiments today suggest those relationships could have been pathogenic or mutually beneficial, and therefore assisting in the evolution of land plants. The colonization of land, much like the emergence of life itself, was a bottom-up process that played out over hundreds of millions of years. And it would be great to have a complete fossil record documenting each step, but the branched filaments that make up hyphae don't fossilize well. Fungi are soft and squishy and tend to decompose easily, unlike what we see in many vascular plants and animals with hard body parts. So a species named Urosfera geraldae was extracted using an acid treatment from sedimentary rock dated to 1 billion years old. The microscopic spore and hyphae appeared fungus-like, and it even absorbed light in the same way that chitin does. Chitin is the complex polysaccharide that makes up the cell wall of most fungi. Chitin is what gives fungal hyphae and the larger growing mycelium its hydrostatic properties to permit exploitation of small confined spaces. Other noteworthy fossil fungi include Tortotubus from 440 million years ago, or Prototaxides from the Devonian period. Prototaxides was a large, wide, and tall fungal structure that may have dotted the landscape long before things like fern forests and gymnosperms were around. So what kind of an organism is a fungus? Bryce Kendrick has worked professionally as a mycologist for decades and offers this definition of a fungus. They are absorptive heterotrophs that usually produce spores with chitinous walls and often have multinucleate walled hyphae. So a heterotrophic organism consumes other organisms. But unlike plants, fungi are not photosynthetic. And unlike animals, fungi are not phagotrophic, which means an organism that ingests chunks of food. Fungi feed by releasing extracellular enzymes from their hyphae, and these enzymes chemically digest their food into simpler molecules, and then those molecules are absorbed into their fungal cells. Complex molecules like lignin and cellulose that are found in woody plants are especially difficult to break down. 
And so wood decomposing fungi use enzymes like ligninases and cellulases for the job. On the tree of life where known species are classified phylogenetically, fungi are most closely related to animals. But as a group, they defy easy classification partly because they don't come from a single common ancestor in the way that plants and animals do. So when mycologists speak of fungi, they tend to use a definition that is more ecological and describes a way of life rather than a family tree. The goal for any good biological classification is to sort taxonomic groups so that a single ancestral population is what gave rise to an entire lineage. For fungi, that standard is only true if we ignore widely distributed groups like the Hyphokytriomycota or the Ootomycota. These are both ecologically very important groups and would exclude things like downy milk mildews and various rusts and the fungal pathogen that caused the Irish potato famine in the 1840s. This massive crop failure killed and displaced millions over just a few short years. If we ignore what amounts to an entire taxonomic kingdom, the Chromista, and just focus on the true fungi, more formally known as the Eumycota, then the fungal story gets a lot easier. Currently just eight phyla recognized. And these eight phyla represent about 100,000 known species and many thousands more remaining to be discovered. The three most basal groups along with the chromistin fungi are often referred to as zoosporic fungi because these are basically aquatic species with some type of flagellum that allows the spore to swim towards food or a mating partner. In the later groups, the flagellum has been lost, and so spores are dispersed in any number of ways, including things like wind, animal vectors, or even raindrops. Spores are the reproductive cells of a fungus, and because they have gone through the cell division process of meiosis, fungal spores are haploid with a single set of chromosomes. Like plants and animals, most fungi can reproduce sexually. But unlike plants and animals, the reproductive cells of a fungus are all the same size, a condition known as isogamy. And in biology, sex is defined by the size of the gametes an organism produces, with females producing large immobile gametes and males producing small swimming gametes known as sperm. For fungi, mating type rather than male and female better describes compatibility between two spores of the same species. Once germinated, compatible mating types can fuse their hyphae and eventually join their two nuclei. In the ascomycota and the basidiomycota, the cells will fuse in a process known as plasmogamy but the two nuclei will not come together, at least not right away. The organism will continue to grow as a mycelium in a dikaryotic state and only fuse nuclei just prior to forming a fruiting body known as a mushroom. Spores by the millions are released from fruiting bodies and can be useful to mycologists and collectors in species identification. How is a yeast related to a fungus? The term describes a growth form, usually single-celled or a cell colony lacking hyphae, but not always. Many yeasts do form hyphae, and all yeasts descended from hyphal ancestors. Yeast evolved multiple times independently from many different fungal phyla, and there are around 1,500 known species. Many of the species are not thought to reproduce sexually. Yeast often reproduce by budding and can grow quickly under the right conditions. Humans have used yeast like Saccharomyces cerevisiae for millennia for making bread and fermenting foods and beverages. At the same time, yeasts and other fungi have used humans for millennia 
by infecting our bodies and causing lesions like ringworm, respiratory illnesses like aspergillosis, and various skin, mouth, and genital infections from Candida albicans. In addition to the historic role of fungi on geological timescales, fungi have profound influences on the growth and renewal of all terrestrial habitats that are vegetated, including forests, grasslands, shrublands, and farm fields. Decomposition of wood and other forest materials depends directly on fungi that can produce the kinds of enzymes needed to use wood as energy for the fungus, and in the process, return nutrients back to the soil. Other fungal species grow symbiotically with plant roots and thus determine which trees will compete effectively in a crowded forest, where sunlight may be limited. And of course, many fungi are well known as pathogens on roots, stems, and leaves, and have contaminated our food supplies throughout history. My favorite fungi, they're the ones that I can eat, like this lion's mane's mushroom that I found at a local farmer's market, or the meaty chanterelles that pop up around here in the summertime. Lots of mushrooms are edible and can be fun to collect, but be sure you know which species are safe to eat. Species like the Amanita verosa have a well-earned reputation for killing unfortunate foragers. This species and most others in this particular genus of Basidiomycota contains amanitins, a class of proteins that blocks the cells in our liver from making RNA, thus resulting in liver failure followed by death. Most states have mushroom clubs or mycological societies that can help guide you and provide resources on edible mushrooms. The North American Mycological Association maintains a list of clubs by state.